welcome. My name is Douglas Getz, and you've found your way to the Diving and Thriving podcast. Here, we have enlightening conversations about how we can better navigate this sometimes crazy world we live in. From refreshing spiritual perspectives to tips about personal growth, the focus here is about how we can become better human beings. So I'd like to thank you for being here today, and I hope you enjoy this episode. Welcome, everyone, to the Diving and Thriving podcast. I have a special guest today in Brittany Dunn. Brittany, how are you? Doing well. I'm excited to be here to speak with you. Yeah, yeah, it was it was cool. You know, your name was in my mind for a little bit. I asked you about a month ago and then didn't work then. Um, And then Anthony Wilson, when I had him on, he also brought up your name. I was like, yes, I got to reach back out to her and. I wanted to see how you were doing. So, yeah, yeah how are you? <sighs> well, I'm excited that Anthony brought up my name because I think this is a good time for me to like be having a nice, deep, you know, soulful conversation with someone. But um, life is, it's moving. Sometimes it's moving a lot faster than I would like it to. Um, and I've just been kind of like living in grief and dealing with heavy, heavy emotions, like on a day-to-day basis. So it's kind of like learning a new way of being really, but I'm here and that's okay. Yeah. Yeah. Life definitely has its ups and downs. Mm. And yeah, sometimes we don't, we don't really get to control those. So there's no control in anything, honestly, we don't control over anything it's in a, it's an illusion <laughs> yeah yeah we like to think we can control things but if you zoom out a little bit there's how little control we actually have yeah it's like there's so many other things that go out go on like even like us speaking today right like how many other things had to happen in order for us to be sitting here like we're not really in control of this moment you know (laughs) yeah yeah the amount of things that had to come together i I remember i listened to a guy uh gary v on instagram one of the things is like we won the genetic lottery it's like one in four trillion of being here right now at this time and it's insane so i mean it's 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 just you got to appreciate here like it's it's tough to to see the good at times, but you know, it's, it's what really can make you enjoy the moment again. And like, and so, I don't know, something that just popped in my head with you saying that it's like, it's hard to see the good when we're stuck in the past or worried about the future. But if you're actually coming back to the now, like that's always beautiful because it's like in this moment, right? Like what can we appreciate in this moment? Yeah. But if I'm worried about other things out of the moment, like that's when it doesn't look so good. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's a skill. That's definitely a skill to be able to stay in the moment, stay in the present moment. Like the guy Eckhart Tolle wrote the book, the power of now, which is like a widely known book. And that the more you stay in the now and the more you focus on what you enjoy, things are just going to work out. And that's, that was a, a really cool uh, book that just is widely known. And, and so, so often we're, we're pulled into the past with thoughts or pulled into the future with other thoughts and, and we miss the present moment. There was like a Harvard study that was done that was like 40% of our day is spent thinking random thoughts. Yeah. It's like, yeah, and I just want to note that like, that skill, how you said, like, that's a skill. It's not something that's really alive for me right now. You know, like I said, I'm living in grief. So there's a lot of not living in the moment and a lot of like being attached to past experiences and worried about future experiences. So even if you do find yourself like being able to live your life more in the moment, um, there could be something that happens that kind of like twists you backwards, you know? Yeah. Yeah, it's it could definitely be rough. Like you just you just experienced the death of somebody that was extremely close to you. So 
I'm so sorry to hear that. And, and yeah, that, that stuff's not easy. It's, it's really not. And yeah. Yeah. How's, how's, uh, like, I'm sure a lot of people have reached out to you and, and, uh, given you support. Um, but you know, it's, it's just something that it just, it just comes and you gotta experience it. Like, in a- yeah, right. Cause death is death, death, whatever yeah. death is inevitable, right? We all will die. Yeah. Um, but it's in like the traumatic experience of like not being prepared for it, you know, where it's just like one second, the person's here and the next second they're not. And there was no, you know, preparation for that. Um, and in that, it's just like, you're kind of like hit like a bus. Like, even if, you know, someone's going to die and you know, they're going to die, it doesn't make it any easier when they die. You still have to deal with the grief. Um, but not knowing that the person's going to die and not knowing like, you know, this is going to be the last time I ever say this to that person. Um, yeah. It really takes you back to, like, I think I, I mentioned this to you, like really moving from the heart, right? Like, cause I was dealing with a lot of guilt and um, yeah. a lot of things that I wish I didn't say or would have said or, or would have done and didn't do whatever. Yeah. And a lot of that was like based off my mind and my ego and like, this person was like the father of my daughter and we have been in each other's lives for 13 years, you know? So there's a lot of history behind that and a lot of hurt. And, um, but that didn't mean that we didn't love each other. And it was hard to like find that love and come back to it. But now that he's gone, like, that's all I want to do. Like it's come back to the love and it's like, I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's like at times like that, you really have to go easy on yourself. Like it's, it's really tough. I remember my grandmother passed away when I was a junior in high school. And I remember walking home one day and she was, she was really not doing too well. I remember walking past her house cause it was right on her way home, my way home. And I was like, eh, I'll stop by tomorrow. Yeah. I'll stop by tomorrow. And then she passed away that night. It was like, oof, that was, it was rough. And, and, like, thankfully, I didn't get on my case too much about that. Like, it would be a thought that would pop in, but, like, I guess, like, I wouldn't dwell on it too much or it wasn't too, too emotionally charged. So it wasn't, like, my fault or I could have done something or I should have done something. It, yeah, I, I thankfully, I didn't, I didn't dwell on that too, too much. But that's, that's the thing that, like, is just regular in, in losing someone. Mm -hmm. so definitely part of that that process right yeah but it's it's heavy it's a lot and um I'm smiling but it's not a happy thing (laughs) no no it's really not it's really not um one of the things that I always uh my dad and I would talk about and I heard this from a couple people um is that we gotta do our best to avoid the words would have should have and could have because as soon as we say those words somebody somewhere feels guilty. So we say to ourselves, oh, damn, I should have said this and we could have done that. And oh, we would have had such a great time. We're going to feel so fucking guilty after saying that, that it's, it's bizarre. So yeah, that's, that's one thing my, my dad and I, we, we joke about if we we're, we're saying something and we say, oh yeah, we, we should have done that. And it was, did you just say should have? <laughs> oh, no, no. I mean, next time, next time. <laughs> and that's what we would phrase it as. If you change those words to next time, I'm going to do this next time. It, it takes the burden off. It takes the guilt off. It's not like I should have, because you can't go in the past and do anything differently. No, you can't. You can't go in the past, but I do want to note that in the death of someone, you also can't go in the future for next time. Oh, so yeah, like, you can't. You're stuck in this like place of knowing that you can't do anything about it, but wanting to change everything. And it's really, yeah. it's a yucky place to be, but understanding that everything does happen for a reason, whether I can see that in this situation in any sense, you know, um, but trusting 
right? Trusting that I am safe and I am held, I'm taken care of here um, by a force that I can't see, a force that's greater than all of us and, and him, you know, he's taken care of as well by that force. So. Yeah. 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 It's, it's one of those things like it's, there's, I mean, what is it? It's like the five stages of grief. Yeah. I don't even know them. I'm like, I know, I, I don't know, them all, <laughs> man, but I just know, I think the last one is acceptance yeah. and boy, is that, that's tough. Yeah. yeah. I remember, I remember listening to, uh, this was a wild one. I was listening to a podcast with a lady and she was talking about her mother and her mother was, was passing away. And it was like a drawn out process. They, they knew she was going to, to be moving on. And she was in the hospital for two, three weeks, getting needles in her arm, just not like having a good time. And eventually when she passed, like the daughter was a wreck for a couple of weeks. And at one point she had this, this really wild thought that was, wait a minute, why I'm upset because it was like my my life was more convenient with my mother in it yeah. my life i had somebody to go to i had somebody to talk to i had this i had that my life was more convenient with my mom in it and now i'm going to miss that convenience that connection that it attachment like, it's really just a, it's attachment right and mm -hmm. that's exactly what it is when you're so attached to the physical form of someone um you know because i believe that like his energy is still present like it's the same energy that's in me the same energy that's in you you know like oh. we come from this divine source but like mm -hmm. it's not him in that physical form and yeah. that's what's hard to accept right yeah so yeah, yeah. it's I guess convenient. I don't really like that word. No, but. <laughs> no. It was, she looked at it in a very different way where it was yeah. like, you know what? My life was so much more convenient with her there. That's why it was like, she realized she was being selfish. And I'm so, like, damn. <laughs> and then in that respect, it helped her get over it. Like, whoa, I'm being selfish by wanting her around. Yeah. And, and it's like, true though. It is for our own selfish reasons, right? Because his story yeah. and this woman's mother's story is not our story. It's not a part of us. It's not what we're supposed to learn and do and, and whatever. So like me wanting him here is kind of selfish because it's, it's not what was meant for him. Yeah. And like, even all of this coming out of my mouth is so weird. Like I don't even really accept it as it's coming out of my mouth, but yeah. like, I know it to be true. So. Yeah. 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 It's different. Like we say things that we know to be true, but it's not necessarily always sunk in necessarily at that moment or on that issue. It's the yeah. more you say it, maybe, maybe it'll sink in. Yeah. 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 We will we'll say it a couple of times. Yeah. For yeah. Sure. Yeah. But yeah, it's, it's one of those things it's, I mean, we come here, so you're, you're on the, the spiritual path and, and our souls come from another dimension and we choose to be here to experience this three-dimensional world. And everybody experiences loss and everybody experiences the hardships. And, and we also get to experience the joys and the, the enjoyable parts. And we've, we've come here to experience this stuff. Um, we only have like 80 years. And, and in reality, what's, what's really nice is that, you know, a lot of times I'll put pressure on myself to be like a great success or do a lot of great stuff. But if you zoom out a little bit, we're on a planet that's circling the sun in a galaxy of a hundred billion galaxies. And so you start zooming out a little bit. And when, when you're, in, when you're, yeah, yeah. When we, when you're there, when you're, you're seeing this world through your eyes, you're saying, wow, it's so important. I got to do this. This is the most important like stuff. This is, you put so much importance on it, but as you zoom out and you realize the world has been here for millions, hundreds of millions of years, you're like, oh yeah, if I, if I don't finish college, it's not the biggest deal. Mm -hmm. If I, if I uh, like mess up here or I quit this job, it's not the biggest of deal. Like, and that's, what's beautiful though, right? Like out of the entire universe, 
like we are experiencing this and we do get to live in a human body and have a conversation like this and connect with people and walk outside and feel the wind and see it's springtime and the trees are blooming and even like those little things like I know not many people might pay attention to, but like that's experiencing, like going to college, amazing. That's awesome, you know, but like, that's not the whole experience. Yeah. So it's like the little things, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's it's funny as you, as you like, you, you realize that at some point that it's, it's more the relationships that you build and the friendships that you have mm-hmm. that really bring this life joy. It's yeah. not- it's not that new toy that you got. It's not, it's, it's the experiences you have and the people you have them with. And that's where I was saying, like with the love, like I can go to college and I can buy a new car and I can, and I can do all these things, but that's not like filling my heart, right? Like when I make a new connection with someone, when I am having these soulful conversations, when I get to go outside and watch a sunset, like that's like filling my heart. And yeah, not to mention like the connections with people, like you said, like when we die, we'll come back to death. I get to live through the people that I've connected with, for the people that are still going to talk about my name and share my stories and, you know, whatever else, if I've helped people along the way, like I get to live on through them. Yeah. And I don't know. Yeah. It's really yeah. just like about the heart and like really yeah. following that. Yeah. It's, it's good stuff. And, and honestly, the world needs more love. It, it doesn't need less. It needs more, <laughs> love. more. <laughs> it needs more compassion. It needs more empathy. It needs more of all of that because I mean, just, just naturally like it's, it's either, and, and there's like, there's a, an idea that all our actions are either motivated out of love or fear. Mm-hmm. And when somebody does something, it's either it's, it's fear-based or it's love-based. And the love-based actions produce better results than the fear-based actions. You want to be acting out of love. Well, yeah, right? Like fear is like, and I'm not saying there's anything wrong with the ego. The ego allows us as humans to experience as like ourselves, right? If we didn't have an ego, there wouldn't be a Brittany. There wouldn't be a Doug. It would just be a you know, whatever. Yeah. So the ego isn't bad. Um, but the fear is the ego, you know, when your mind starts to tell you all the things that could go wrong or the potential of whatever, and you make decisions because you're afraid of something happening, or you're afraid of something not happening, you're setting yourself up for failure, honestly. Um, because if we come back to the heart where we all are connected through that space, like, how I said earlier, like the divine source, whatever, like that is our heart. It's our soul. And when you make your decisions based on that, like, I'm not going to say you're not going to experience sadness. That's part of the journey, right? Like you can't experience happiness if you don't experience sadness, but you will always be okay. Like you're on your path. And the more you follow your heart, the more you're going to see things fall in alignment. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's big. Um, yeah, and this we we go through so many trans transitions in life and and growth, and we learn so much stuff along the way. One of the best things that that I've found is self awareness, yeah. like to be able to notice myself when I'm doing certain things. Like, wait a minute, why did I just do that? Mm-hmm. And, and kind of catch myself and and like really like look into it and talk about it with other people. Um, that's, it's such a huge thing to be able to, to be aware of if you're coming from love or if you're coming from fear. Yeah. Questioning everything, honestly, like I, I, (laughs) I know it doesn't really make much sense, but like, I would say like when in doubt, like ask a question, like, honestly, like if you're not freaking sure about like you would ask a question, but I mean, like if you're in doubt with yourself, like, like you said, like, why am I doing this? Or why have I, Oh, like, I don't like the word always, but why do I have a tendency to make this same decision? And then I'm seeing these same results. Yeah. Um, yeah, for sure. Questions are so important and it helps you learn about yourself and learn about like your external world and how that relates to you. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's big, you know, it kind of, it allows you to, to be able to grow, to put yourself in that position where you can say, do I want to keep doing this? Do I want to keep repeating this? I know what, what it's, what the result has been, 
yeah. from doing this? Do I want to keep doing that? And that's, that's really the question. So yeah, self-awareness is so huge. But you've actually gotten into some really cool stuff in, within the past couple of years. You've become a transformation coach, transformational coach. I have definitely been trying to build. I have been. I don't want to say trying, but yes, I have been building. You are. Yes, my business, and it has been on like a yeah, little standstill um, since the the death of my daughter's father, whose name yeah. is Michael. So I'll say Michael. Actually. Um, but it's just like I'm relearning myself and you're not able to like hold space for other people like when you're still yeah. holding so much for yourself. So as of right now, I'm still trying to figure myself out and and look in the direction that I'm trying to go. But, um, yeah. but yeah. yeah, and I'll say one thing though, like with that, like I wouldn't have been able to be that a transformational coach um, transform my life and guide others to transform their lives without self-awareness. Um, something that I like to say is like radical responsibility. Mm. So it's like understanding that, and I'm not saying it's our fault necessarily for all the things that happen in our lives. Um, because there are traumatic experiences that, you know, we didn't ask for, or we didn't like take part in happening to us, but we are responsible for ourselves in the future and in, in the now, whatever, right? Like making choices in the now to shape our lives in the future. And you can't wait for other people to do it. You can't wait for it to fall into your lap. It's like understanding it is your responsibility to make it happen. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's big, you know, it's, and you know, one of the cool things, cause I'm, I'm going down the life coaching path as well. So it's, it's a very similar kind of road and it's, you, you have to work through your own stuff mm -hmm. before you can help others work through their stuff. For sure. Yeah. So I'm, I'm curious, what led you to begin on that journey? Where, where did that start? What, what was the catalyst for change? The catalyst for change was me hiring my own coach and digging into myself and seeing, you know, like I had a point in my life where it was so dark. Like I woke up every day and I was just like, why the fuck am I here? Like literally, why am I here? You know, I, I had a daughter and I felt like I couldn't do anything for her. I couldn't do anything for myself. I was just in a really dark, dark, dark space. And I ended up seeing like something's not working, right? Yeah, something's yeah. not working. And I felt this like little like glimmer of hope still. And um I have a friend who I graduated with in high school and she was a coach, like a transformational coach, life coach, whatever. Yeah. And um, I worked with her and I saw not everything changed, but I saw how much lighter I felt inside. And I woke up seeing the possibility and I woke up seeing like, I do have a purpose. And I woke up seeing like, my will to like keep going, you know? And I'm like, wow, this is fucking amazing. And then I also see how much my story could help others and like how much I've gone through and to like pull yourself out of like deep, deep waters like that and, and still see your worth as a person and like wanting to help others. It's just like, it just clicked, you know? It was like, this is, this is what I'm meant to be doing, so. Yeah. Yeah, it feels good to help other people. It feels good to to listen. And at the end of the conversation, they say, thank you. That really helped. That's Yeah, but listening, that's all you have to do is listen. I know. <laughs> you don't have to tell them. You just have to listen. <laughs> I know. I know. Just just listen. And it's it's really cool because I'll do that for certain people. And like I'll, I'll get in my head kind of what I need to say. But I'll spend another five, 10 minutes of listening before I, I make that suggestion. Mm -hmm. And, and you know, so many times people just want to be heard. Mm -hmm. Like there's, there's so much stuff that's pent up inside that's going on from this or from work or from family or from stress of, of whatever kind. And it just, it bottles up and it needs to get out first. So if, if you're not hearing somebody, if, if you're not being heard, they're not going to take your advice. 
Um, and who, how many people really do have someone that truly listens to them? Like you said, like they have pent up stuff from work or their relationships or, or whatever. And how many other people are like that? And how many people just want to speak? And so you have the people who, you know, I'm talking to this person, but they're cutting me off because they want to say all the things that are happening in their life. And it's just like, you're not really listening. You know, you can't be listening if you're doing that. And you can't be listening if the whole time I'm talking, you're just like in your own world, worried about all the things you have to do when you go home or all the things you have to do tomorrow. It's like allowing yourself to yeah. move all of that away and being here and yeah. hearing what that other person is actually saying. Yeah. Yeah. And that's, that's such a common thing within certain friendships is that both people are excited to talk about themselves and it's, that's nice. It's, it's <laughs> not a bad friendship. Um, but it's like, it's, I have the same thing. I have certain friends that I know who I can dive deeper into topics with because they'll just sit on their end and listen. And then they'll ask a good question and I'll say, wait a minute, that's, let me think about that. And by the end of the conversation, how much better do you feel after somebody really hears you? It's night and day. It's, it's as you, if there's, like you feel it. Like you yeah, feel there's a weight perfect. off your shoulders. Like you yeah. can breathe deeper. Mm -hmm. It's there. So yeah. Yeah. So, so what, so you said you were, you were going through some dark waters and, and it was like a tough time. What, what really, what, what was that like? What was, cause I remember in high school, like, I didn't really know you too, too much, but you're a bit of a firecracker. <laughs> and, yeah. and from that to now is, is a big transformation. Yeah. Well, thank you for um, that reflection. Yeah. But yeah. So it's like, like I said, I, in my personal experience have been through a lot. Um, I, I wasn't born in, into the most uh, loving kind of household. Um, and I grew up with my, my dad being an alcoholic and um, drug addict. And, you know, my mom like worked a lot and I was an only child. I didn't have any other like siblings to lean on and relate to. Mm -hmm. um, so then I grew up and really just had so much pent up anger and resentment. And that's kind of like what was shown in my external world, right? Like all of what I felt on the inside. Um, but not knowing that because I, I don't have, I didn't have the awareness that I do now. Yeah. yeah. So then, you know, you grow older and I had a, I had a kid and I, I'm in a relationship where like, I really love this person, but it's not working because I am sad and he is sad, you know, like we're both so sad. We can't like come together, but you know, I had my child, I was 20 years old. And after you have a kid, it's like, you, you want to give your kid the whole world. Um, so things got really, really dark for me when I realized like I wasn't capable of doing that. And I was seeing a lot of, um, nasty habits like yelling and in being impatient. Um, and that didn't make me feel good. It made me feel really guilty and worse about myself because I don't want to treat my daughter that way, but it was like, I couldn't stop it. Um, it was just like reactive behaviors. So yeah, I don't know. There was just a lot of that, a lot of reactive behaviors, a lot of like me just living in anger and resentment. Um, and something had to happen, you know, something had to change because if it didn't, like, I, I, I wouldn't even know like where I would be right now. So. Yeah. Yeah. It's those reactive behaviors that's where self-awareness really comes into play. Mm -hmm. And then it's, so why did I react that way? And so much of it is, is, is how we, how we've grown up. Mm -hmm. Like the things that, that we've seen and experienced from our parents, like trickle right into us. Like, like it could be big things or it could be small things. And it's how much of that, that did I take on? How much of that is good? How much of that do I want to keep? And what of that do I want to let go? Yeah. And it's not just, 
doesn't always have to be so black and white. Like it doesn't always have to be like this happened to me or like my parents treated me this way. It's also like as deep as like just generational trauma, like where my parents felt this way about themselves and I end up taking on that energy. Um, you yeah. know, like we begin feeling a certain type of way about ourselves and our environment in the womb. Like that early on in my mom's womb, depending on what was going on and how she was feeling on an energetic yeah. level, I began to take that on, you know? So it's like, <clears throat> there's just so much that we can't see. So like a lot of people don't understand because you can't see it. But like I said, it's bringing that radical responsibility. So like, even if I don't know, even if I don't understand, it's, it's wanting to make a change and knowing that I'm the sole person that can make that change. So when I was able to like move myself into that mindset um, and stop waiting for this, like, you know, prince on a fucking white horse to come and save me type stuff. It was like, I can yeah. be that for myself and I can make my life different, you know? Yeah. 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 That's the, the fact that you're going to have to do it yourself. Yeah. There's nobody else. Nobody else is going to do the work for you. Yeah. Nobody can do that for you. No, <laughs> no one can do that for you. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And it's ugly. It's not fun. It's not. It's not. No, it's really not. Yeah. But at the same time, it is because you get to laugh and you get to like see like, like I don't get me wrong. Sometimes I still do get embarrassed thinking about half the shit I've done. And I'm only 25, you know, it's like, yeah. wow, like you really lived your life. But I don't know. I get to laugh about it now. And I get to see, like you said, like how much I've changed, like as a person, like I know the work works. I know that it makes a difference because I am that example. Yeah. Yeah. You mentioned one part, one thing of feeling lighter mm. as you were going after you did some of it. That's a beautiful feeling, honestly. Like I've felt that at times and then I've also felt heavy at times and it's, it feels nice to be feel light, feel airy, feel like, oh, that happened. It's not a big deal. Like just to be able to let things go, not be so attached to the result and just, eh, we'll try it again another time. That's okay. Yeah. And it, it feels good. Mm -hmm. it, or even just waking up and not feeling the heaviness of what you don't even understand. You know, like I dealt with a lot of anxiety on a day-to-day -day basis, sometimes having panic attacks every day. And um, that was just a physical manifestation of what was going on inside. So when you start digging through that shit and you're literally clearing it out, like you can feel the lightness within, like you can feel that's not holding on and dragging me down anymore. Like I literally, you know, I feel I don't know the word, but yeah, lighter, better, it's lighter. There we go. Lighter, better. Yeah. More happy, more relaxed, more calm and, and able to go about your day with a presence instead of being scattered, scattered, scattered. That's it. That's definitely how it was, you know, just yeah. always worried about something. Your thoughts are always everywhere else, but like right here. Yeah. So. Yeah. It's that's big. So what kind of work did you do with that transformational coach that you had? What kind of, what, what did the work look like? Um, well, something that she had suggested for us was to cut out certain things from our diet. And she suggested like sugar, salt, oils, and gluten. But I like went the extra step because I just, I've always wanted to like, quit meat. So I ended up like quitting meat and dairy, uh, like all this stuff. And I was really just like filling my body with like alive foods, foods that make me feel alive. So that was a huge, huge difference. Cause I, I didn't feel so sluggish after eating a meal. I didn't yeah. feel so tired. I literally had so much energy and that in itself made a huge difference because I can get up and I can do these tasks of the day and still be like, yes, let's go. And yeah. like, I need to go to fuck to sleep, you know? So 
that was a big thing. Um, nice. And I honestly can't remember too much of like, like things that she had like written down for us, but like I did a lot of journaling. I started journaling and I started like writing to myself about myself and, and really just asking questions. Like we said, you know, earlier yeah. asking, you know, why is it that I do this and really paying attention and bringing self-awareness and then bringing it into a space. Cause it was like a group therapy, not therapy, group coaching. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, bringing it into this space and sharing it with others who are hearing me and seeing me and holding me and loving me. So it's like in that it's healing and it's just, I don't know. Yeah. 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 There's, there's a huge benefit to journaling. Oh my gosh. Yes. Huge benefit. Like questions that you have. Um, I heard it even connects like right brain and left brain kind of thinking as you're, you're doing both. Uh, at that time, like I'll write questions, something will happen and I'll, why, why did they ask me that? Mm -hmm. And I'll, I'll like kind of dive into it. And I was like, oh, they're asking that because they're insecure about that. Oh, okay. And then I'll just kind of work it out through my head. And it kind of, you, you can do that with somebody else or you can do it within a journal and slowly working through topics of the thoughts that come up and, and it's so beneficial because I feel once I write something down, I don't really have to revisit it. I already, I wrote it down. It's there. It's, it's accounted for. Like I've, I've already, what else is there? What, what other aspect of, of there is it is to there. And then you kind of get the whole thought, the whole situation on paper. And then you say, okay, how do I want to proceed? How do I want the situation to look? And journaling is hugely beneficial for that. So that's awesome. Yeah, and I, I don't know exactly what you just said because I was listening, but um, no, no, no. It, it sparked in me. It's just like putting it outside of yourself. Like so often do we keep a lot of the things that are like holding us down or those questions inside of us because we feel oh, I don't want to share this with this person or, you know, it doesn't really make sense for me to like say this or, or whatever it is. But like when you're putting it like pen to paper, so it's outside of you now, right? It's not holding me down anymore. And it's on that paper. And I don't, like you said, like, I don't have to revisit it, you know, but it feels good enough for me to like put it here. Yeah. And one thing that is important with journaling is like, because I found myself sometimes almost writing as if I thought someone was going to read it and mm, yeah. it didn't it didn't strike the the healing within that yeah. like, and I'm allowing myself like I can't even you know I don't even know what's going on like I could look in some of my journals and you could barely read my handwriting because it's just like coming out you know like that's the yeah. real healing in there yeah Mm -hmm. That's great. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's something about journaling that really lets you be honest with yourself. Yeah. And so, yeah, if you're writing, like you think someone's going to read it, like, I got to change these words. I got to make it sound a little better. Yeah. Or yeah. just not even truly going like just so deep because you're like, you know, like you wouldn't want someone to read that or you wouldn't want someone to know that about you. And it's just like, yeah, and go about it that way. You just got to no. like pour it all on the paper. Yeah, yeah, that's that's so not the idea behind <laughs> yeah. journaling. If somebody does that, that's so wrong of them. They should well, not wrong, right? I need to get a talking to. Yeah, but it's it's not like I'm not the only one. Like that's been talked about, you know, like me with people and me in group settings, it's it's hard to sometimes, especially someone who's not like used to writing, fully open themselves up to that practice um because it's raw and it's vulnerable and sometimes people are afraid it's going to be read or seen you know so it's like yeah, yeah i don't know one thing one thing i've started to do which is really cool is that i'll like are you are you right-handed or left-handed i'm right-handed you're right-handed so am i so a lot of my journal entries i write right-handed and that's like it's known that our right side of our body is connected to our left brain and our left side of our body is connected to our right brain. And so what I'll start doing in my journal entries is I'll start writing left-handed and I'll see like what thoughts come up from doing that. And as you're writing left-handed, you're not so concerned of getting all the words on the paper. It's yeah. more of 
So you'll you'll condense what you're trying to say. You're more focused on the writing. And I think something about that brings me more into the present moment. And it, it accesses a different part of my brain that's that's more creative or more can see the situation in a different light. And like it's a lot of times it's it's about perspective. And so if you can change your perspective on a situation, it's no longer an issue. Um, that's something that I've found is, has been super cool for me is if I just want to get into a different headspace, I'll write a journal entry or I'll write something left-handed. If I'm doing it right-handed, I'm thinking, all right, should I start my paragraph here or should I start it two lines down? What, what do I want it to look like? I want it to be uniform with the rest of my journal entries. I don't want it to deviate. If I'm doing it left-handed, I'm like, okay, well, we're going to write diagonally here. <laughs> we're going to like, and it doesn't matter. And it's, it's really cool because it's, it's a break from the usual. It's a break from kind of the structures that I've set up for myself for how I think things should look and how like perfect, like it should all be set up. And it kind of throws all that out the window and just, okay, what topics do you want to address? I like that. And it's also like in a smaller sense, but being uncomfortable in that situation, you know, like writing with my left hand, I could see that making me really uncomfortable because I'm not in so much control and it's not looking the way that I want it to, but like being okay with it being uncomfortable and like then moving that into your life on a sense is like, that's beautiful. Like yeah. leaning into the uncomfortable and embracing that. That's pretty cool. Yeah. Say one thing, like, excuse if you can hear in the background, my dog is like tearing up something back there. <laughs> and I have no idea what it is, but I'm just letting him go at it. <laughs> well, you'll find out later. Yep. Hope, it's, mm -hmm. <laughs> hope it's nothing big. Yeah. No, that's funny. But yeah, yeah, that's that's something that I've found. It's helped me kind of get into a different mindset. Like there are times when we get caught up in mindsets that don't necessarily serve us or we just obsess over the same thought process and it's, this isn't helping me. Um, and so it's at times it's how do I break out of that mindset? One thing that I've done is I've gone on runs. If I'm so stuck on trying to resist doing something and I got to muster up so much energy to do that thing, whatever it is, I'll, I'll go on a run and I'll get it going that way. And then I'll eat some food or meditate and then eat some food. And it's like, okay, now I got the energy to do that. And so that's, that's like the traditional way I'll go. But the other way is just like do some, some left-handed work or start being creative there. Cause at times like I'll, I'll get, I've been very logical, very like process oriented, not too, too creative. And so it's, it's the balance between left brain and right brain. And both have benefits and, and too much of one I'm sure is, is, uh, it can be good or it can not be good, but balance is, is always key. And there's, there's benefits to both sides, left brain, right brain, masculine, feminine, and balance, balance, balance. I do want to say something that came up for me yeah. um, while you were speaking about like running and like, like for me, it's if something happens and not so much right now, like I do want to note that, like I'm not really using so many of those practices because I'm kind of just in it, you know, I'm just yeah. like in this, whatever. You're feeling, um, yeah. But I can come back to how I was doing things because yeah. um, it's still very much alive in me, but mm -hmm. getting into my body, you know, like you said, like running. And for me, it's dancing. Like I like to get yeah. into my body and dance and just allow myself to be present in that experience. And a lot of the times it's like, I stop dancing and I'm a whole new person. Um, so yeah. really yeah, like getting into your body is, is so beneficial. Yeah. Yeah. I think dancing is, is a fantastic way of, of getting out of whatever funk you're in. Yeah. Cause, cause you you're start right there. You know, your head. You into your body you're like in this experience and i'm not oh. worried about anything so then when i come back to that i have a clearer mind you know yeah yeah dancing is a fantastic way to just let things flow like at times you'll you'll be you're too rigid or too focused and you're like i gotta loosen up it's like <laughs> my joints are rusty <laughs> to, to yeah. loosen them up it's it's that dancing is is great 
honestly, like running kind of just distracts from, from my head, but it also kind of gets me into my body. So, so like you said, dancing definitely does that. Also playing instruments and singing too. Like I don't, I don't do those nearly enough. Um, but, but those are things, whatever brings you into the present moment is, is big. It's important because now you're not worried about that stuff that was going on in your head and you can approach it from a better state. And that's something to note is it, it will be different for all of us. You know, it's like whatever it is for that individual to come into the moment. And for mm -hmm. you, that could be running and whatever. And for me, that could be dancing and whatever. And for the next person, it might not have anything to do with that, but it works for them. And that's yeah. okay. But yeah. I do like that you mentioned music because that is something um, since Michael's death that I've picked up. Mm. I had a ukulele and I've had it for a few years. Yeah. Um, but I would just like play it for a couple of days and put it down for, you know, half a year and play it for a couple of days and like put it down. Yeah. And since he's died, I've played it pretty much every day. Um, so yeah. that'll be like three months tomorrow. Yeah. And wow, it's me. Like that was like the one thing I would wake up and be, you know, just so sad, but like I'd pick up the ukulele and I would feel like just some kind of peace, you know, like yeah. playing and learning and just being mm -hmm. connected through. Yeah. Through that, so. Yeah. It's, it's a special thing. Um, it's something that forces you to be present and forces you to kind of address the mind that's talking to us as we're playing. Like, oh, you messed that up. You keep going too quick. Okay. Well, let me slow down then. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, um, it's, and it's, it's just fun, you know. It is. It's fun too. Like it's it's one of those things that brings you to the present moment, like running or dancing, singing too. I'm sure there's there's countless other activities. Art will do that if you get into a coloring book, and you. And that's really like inner child stuff. Like, how can I have more fun? Like, how can I feed my inner child? Yeah. I need my child, my inner child, to come out to play, kind of thing, you know. And that's that's always gonna do something beneficial like always yeah. yeah that inner child work is definitely I think it's something a lot of people miss a lot of adults miss um because if, if you get too caught up in your responsibilities and things you have to get done you forget about it and if you do that for so many years it's like it's it's just life I gotta I gotta power through this now and it's it becomes not enjoyable and that should never be the case it life should be enjoyable if and it goes to balance yes and if you got to buckle down at times okay but make sure you set up your vacation make sure you get your your time with your friends where you can goof off um but that inner child stuff is huge uh and and it's one of the i my best friend john spike has has two kids i'm the godfather to his daughter ellie who's three years old and I have such a joy hanging out with him and his family because I hang out with the kids and they're just, they're down to play all the time, mm -hmm. all the time. And we'll go to the park and it's like, okay, what do you want to do? Do you want to go on the slides? Do you want to go on the swings? Like, what do you want to do? Do you want to play in the sand? Great. I'll take my shoes off. <laughs> and it's stuff like that, that we really, really got to stay in touch with that inner child because if we lose that, it's, it becomes a lot less fun. Mm -hmm. yeah. And it's almost not, it's not like, I don't know how to word this, but it's kind of what society teaches us, right? To, mm -hmm. to lose interest in, in anything that kind of brings out the joy and, and the inner child. They want us to work 40 hours a week or more because we can't really afford to live anywhere on 40 hours a week. So it's like, they want you to work, work, work. And then you don't have time for anything except sleeping or maybe, you know, like a lot of people are drinking to take the edge off and, and stuff like that. So yeah, it's kind of how it's been set up for people. Yeah. Um, so to come back to that is like breaking out of the norm and like understanding that you are worthy of still having fun and you are worthy of being playful and feeding your inner child because just because you're older doesn't like I tell people I'm a fucking kid like I am a kid I like, know I, like, I know yeah and it feels good too when people start saying man I'm getting old it's no like, I'll that's no fun bottles with my daughter like I lay out in the rain you know like and again right now it's been hard for me to like really be so present and playing with her like hands-on but 
I do that, you know, like it's, it's a lot of fun to, to live your life through the eyes of a child. Like you said, <sighs> you take them to the park and they're not worried about anything. They're just worried about like, what am I going to do? That's going to make me happy right now. Exactly. If we, could, if we could all ask ourselves that one question, like what is going to make me feel good right now? What is going to make me happy right now? How yeah. much different would life be? You know? Yeah. Yeah. Life, life would be very different. Honestly. Yeah. yeah it's, <laughs> It's, it's the balance, you know, this past year I've really struggled or I went, I went back and forth a lot with the balance of, of, do I, do I go with what I'm feeling or do I go with what I plan for myself? And it was, it was such, you know, I noticed cause I was, I was diving cause everybody's got masculine and feminine within them. And it's like left brain, right brain, like processes and logical versus creative and, and free flowing. Yeah. So there were, there were times where, where I like to see both things, both sides of things. And I was diving into my feminine and then I go back to the masculine and I was like, at times I, I would be deciding on something and both routes seemed good. And so it was like kind of a tug of war that was going on. And I was like, this is fucking excruciating. <laughs> it's all going on mentally and I'm doing this to myself, but it was, it was something big like that. So it's, it's kind of like seeing where you fall and what works best for you. Um, and then making sure to also spend time to, to check in with yourself. My friend yesterday uh, mentioned a great thing about having emotional check-ins. Mm -hmm. And everybody should be doing that. Regardless of, of guy, girl, age, doesn't matter. It's, it's how am I doing today? Make sure I, I check in with myself for mm -hmm. 10 minutes, 15 minutes. And that could be like even like meditating, you know, like for me that is kind of like an emotional check-in and yeah. if that's for five, 10, 15 minutes, however long it goes, you know, I'm just, I'm feeling in tune to how I feel emotionally, physically, energetically, all of it, you know, cause when you're meditating and, and you're coming into that space, it's not always comfortable and you can't always relax. And on the times, on the days that like you can't relax, you know, you, you can see something else is happening externally or internally that's making me feel this way. Um, so that is a check-in and then you can see yeah. like, what can I do differently? Or, you know, what can I remove from my day today to, to help me not feel that way? Yeah. So, yeah, I agree with that. That's yeah. definitely something we should all be doing. <laughs> we should all be doing that. Yeah. Whether it's meditating or it's journaling or it's figuring yeah. out how you do your emotional check-in, like, how are you doing? Oh, that's, mm -hmm. that's a good question. I haven't asked myself that today. But then you ask yourself, how many people ask another person, how are they doing when they don't really have the time or space to listen? So then it's like understanding that you're making the time and space for yourself when you ask that question, right? So like, if you're the type of person who asks someone, how are you doing when you're just expecting them to say good, are you really going to check in deeply with yourself when you're asking yourself, how are you doing? You know, Yeah. But that's, oh my goodness. Since, since, you know, Michael, Michael's death, that's one thing that I've noticed is how many people ask you how you're doing, but don't really want to hear an answer other than good. Because I'm not the type of person to lie. And it could be a random person on the street and they're like, how are you doing? And I was like, shitty, you know, like that's how, that was the honest truth. And they were like, you know, like they looked at me and it's just like, well, what did you expect me to say? You don't know what's going on in my life, but you asked me how I'm doing. So I don't know. And not that we shouldn't ask people how they're doing, but you have to ask yourself, do I have the time and space to really be present with this person if they're not just doing good or okay? But yeah. that went off topic. I don't know. No, no, I think that's great. It, it definitely is a, just a snap response. And if, if you're not just, Hey, how you doing? Oh, I'm good. I'm all right. I'm Okay, good, good. And then you but if you're not, then you're lying to this person and yourself, you know, like you're denying your feelings. Yeah, yeah. Sometimes you say, like, I don't want this guy knowing my business. And so I'm I'm good. Yeah, I'm, uh -huh. I'm good. Um, but yeah, you can even even if somebody says they're not doing too well or they are good, like that next follow-up question is is always big because it's do we stay in small talk or do we go to big talk? Uh -huh. What are what are you excited about? Mm, like, oh, that's a good question <laughs> what, what are you passionate about what what things do you need to change in your life 
Oh shit! I just, I just, we're just at the bus stop together. I'm running away from that one. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, Yeah, but it's it's cool stuff. It's it's those are definitely questions that create a better connection. You you definitely get to know somebody. Yeah, and I see that. Like I've kind of tried to do that with my daughter since a really young age. Instead of like asking her, "How was your day?" most of the time she, she would say, I don't know. Like, and she's like, what do you mean you don't know? But does she really know? Like, does she know deeply like what she's supposed to say to that question? So I learned to ask her more of like, did anything make you smile or did anyone make you laugh? Or like, what was funny today? Or yeah. I would ask her sometimes like, were you sad? Like what made you sad or, or anything? And she will answer more responsibly to those kinds of questions than the broader how was your day? You that's know? good. Yeah, that's good. It that's really cool because then it puts more of the responsibility on the the question, the person asking the questions, mm-hmm. more so than the person giving the answers. Yeah. So and- yeah, it's asking good questions. It's really cool. I uh, one lady that I met, she was a, a mentor for a little bit of time. She was an older lady um, that I didn't think she was going to be a mentor, but she was for a little bit. And she used to be a journalist down in Washington, DC. And so she would spend her time in the mornings just rehearsing a question, asking it over and over and over again. And the way to make inflections and certain things. And what she learned is that asking good questions is one of the best shortcuts in life. Mm -hmm. Asking good questions. Because you you can find out a lot from asking a question, especially a good question too. And, and that was like, that was one of her, her big things. She would ask these questions to the person at the podium. And if it was a really good question, she'd build rapport with the person at the podium. And then on top of that, she'd also build rapport with everybody in the room because they would say, wow, who's that? And, and that, was, that was one of the things that she really, really stood by is asking good questions. And it's also, if we come back to, you know, like being a life coach, or a transformational coach, that's what you want to do. You know, yeah. you don't want to tell people the answers. You want to ask good questions because we all have the answers. Like you can't tell me what's best for me. Only I can, but asking me a question to make me think is going to help me come up with the answers by myself, you know? So yeah. that's really asking good questions is yeah, it's, it's yeah. healing. It's helpful. And I could see it definitely helping your life in a sense, like, like you said, with that lady. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's a huge point. You know, you can, you can ask somebody questions and you can make statements or you can ask them questions. And and if you ask them questions, it kind of opens up like where they want to take it. And so you can kind of go there with them versus try to control the conversation, which friends may do with each other or it's like i got this view you should do it my way it's like whoa 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 easy so control (laughs) that's a hard one though because i've lived my life trying to control everything um so like releasing that and trusting like it's coming back to trust so yeah control is about um when maybe you've grown up this way or you've had experiences that have shown you can't, you can't always trust people or, you know, trust your external environment, whatever it is, you, you learn to control what you can, but then you start thinking that you can control more than you can. And it just, it's not so good. (laughs) No, no, no. It's, it's good to a certain extent, but then like anything, you can take it too far and oh yeah, that's, you could cause some issues there. Cause you ask yourself like what, what can we really control, right? I can control what I say. I can control what I eat. I can control what I do. Um, I can control where I go sometimes. But other than that, like, I can't control anything you do or say. I can't control anything that's going on outside of me. So there's not many things that you can control. (laughs) There's There's that old saying, you can't control what happens to you, but you can control how you respond to what happens to you. Yeah. And that's a big one. And then there was another one that I heard that was, we can't always control our first thought, 
but we can control our second thought. Oh yeah. And your first thought, that's, that's your programming, yeah. you know, but that's where the questions come in. Mm -hmm. Like that happens for me all the time. Like I'll think a thought and it's just like, Whoa, where the fuck did you come from? Or like, yeah. why am I saying that? Yeah. Like, oh, yeah. yeah. And then I'm allowed to like almost reparent myself or, or reprogram myself, you know, to yeah. live and think differently. Yeah. That's, that's awesome. And that's, that's, that's a key to, to really kind of change certain things in your life. And, and yeah, thought process that thought processes and mindsets definitely create our reality. So creating a new reality starts up there. It starts in your head. But it also takes understanding that you are not your thoughts because a lot of us, and I know me included for a very, very long time, you know, I had deep, dark, very sad thoughts and you relate that to you and you make it a part of you. And <clears throat> they're not, you know, it's, it's not you. Um, so even if those thoughts like come out to say, hi, you can question yourself, but you can also, I began to take in practice of like thanking them, like, thank you for showing me what it is like I need to work on or what it is I can do differently or something that, you know, I still need healing in, you know? So like those thoughts are not mine, but they're showing me certain things about myself sometimes that you know need working on still that's, yeah that's good yeah um yeah so so one of the things you, you said you're most proud of is, is being a mother oh yeah your, your daughter is how old you said five five and a half five and a half <laughs> that's so great yeah um so how has that process been being Woo! a mother and what specifically like i, I know a lot of people, it's one of the most fulfilling aspects of life, being a mother, being a parent. And I, what I love about it is that you learn so much in the process. So just dive into like how it has been as, as a mother, what you've learned and, and what your daughter has taught you. Okay. I'm going to take a breath for this one. <sighs> hmm. Being a mother has changed everything for me. Like I will go as far as to say, if I never got pregnant, I, I probably wouldn't be alive today, like speaking with you. Um, so that, right, she, she kind of gave me a second chance at life. Um, but it is fucking difficult for someone like me who wasn't really shown you know, parenting styles that are healthy. Um, so learning to parent her is also learning to parent myself. Like I have to reparent myself. How I spoke earlier, I found myself being very reactive to her and impatient and yelling, um, which is not her fault. You know, it's showing me the things that I need to work on. It's showing me the things that are alive inside of me that are outside of her that have nothing to do with her. So it's just being a parent triggered a lot of those things in a way that I'd never saw before. Um, so it's been beautiful to not only witness myself in that, but healing, not fully, still healing those aspects of myself because of her. Um, and she's still teaching me patience every day, <laughs> like every day. But most of all, it's just like that unconditional love, you know, like it doesn't matter what happens at the end of the day, she's cuddled up with mommy and it's, it's so beautiful. It's just, it's really a whole different kind of experience, that kind of love for this, this little being that depends on you for so much. And then they end up growing up and they becoming more of themselves and you, and you get to see the parts of you that are reflected through their way of being and also how different they are and, and how they have formed their themselves from their experiences. And it's just, it's truly incredible. It really is. Yeah. That's, that's awesome. That's, that's really awesome. Yeah. Um, especially I, I totally see the patience aspect. <laughs> the thing. Oh my gosh. Whew. I don't know how my friend does it. It's, it's every day too. It's you, you can't return them. No, you can't. And it's constant. And yeah. it was very impatient 
um, for a long, long time. So that just being who I was, you know, like constantly triggered, constantly reactive. Um, and let me take that back. It wasn't who I was. It was how I learned to be. Um, but that is how I was living. So seeing now, like bringing patience, it, she's a whole different kid, you know, when I'm patient, she's a whole different child mm -hmm. when I'm able to sit there and be with her and breathe and allow her to have a hard time or allow her to ask questions or allow her to just be however she's being. But like when I'm impatient, she's then reactive, you know, she's like, well, what the hell's going on? You know, like, I need you to be my, like my solid person here. Um, and after her father died, I became a little, not a little, but a lot more impatient. Um, after, you know, being for a, a while, very patient and very present with her and allowing her to just like be her own person and, and being there for her in when she's having a hard time. But when I couldn't be that for myself, I saw the impatientness come back, whether that's a word, impatientness, I don't know. Yeah. Um, and I can see how much she's changed since that happening, you know? So, yeah. 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 I think that that's really cool. One of the, what you just said of, of uh, your, your daughter acted different when you were patient versus impatient. She, oh, yeah. You would see different responses. For sure. It's yeah. literally a whole different child. Like yeah. if I can, if she's having a hard time, like if she's, you know, instances where she's screaming and yelling and sometimes throwing things, if I'm able to like be with her and allow her to have that space to just feel safe and yeah. allowing these emotions to come out. And then if need be redirecting her to something more healthy, you know, like if she's throwing things at me, that's not okay. So if we can do things to make you feel better, like, she she's literally a whole different kid but if she's doing that and then i end up saying like avalyn you know like go to your room or something like whatever then she's like what and she gets more sad and more reactive and she just wants the attention so she's gonna then go for negative attention if she's not getting anything yeah yeah that's that's true yeah being especially in those moments being present mm -hmm. is is huge and taking time and just being there um yeah yeah and just waiting through it like it's it's how we talked earlier like listening right they want to be listened to they yeah, want to yeah they do they're they're people we yeah. want to control them as parents that's such a huge thing like we think that we can control who they are as people mm -hmm. but you can't you know you can't control them you can only guide them so yeah yeah, that's, that's, uh, I always find one of the, how do you deal with, they want something, but they can't have it. Like we gotta, I want ice cream. Well, we gotta go somewhere, sweetie. We can't, I we don't have ice cream. How do you deal with those interactions? <laughs> so I think you kind of like pick and choose your battles kind of thing, but I've always been the parent. Like I was never like big on just giving her whatever she wanted. Um, even when I didn't know how to be so healthy for myself, I knew I didn't want her to adapt those habits, which she still has over time. Um, cause I'm not the only person that influences her in a way, but yeah. in those moments, it's like asking myself, why am I saying no? Or why am I thinking about saying no? Because usually like my first instinct and I won't always voice it, but like the thought will arise like, no, no, she can't have that. Yeah. And I have to ask myself literally like, why, like, why can't she have that? Or why do you not want her to have it? And if it's something like, you know, she's getting ready for bed, that's pretty easy. That's a pretty easy yeah. call. Well, Avalyn, yeah. you know, you just brushed your teeth. You can't have chocolate ice cream. Yeah. But if it's something where it's like, okay, she just ate her dinner and, you know, she's asking for a snack and like, you want to say no, it's then coming back to she is her own person and I have to trust that like she's going to understand how to take care of herself even if I allow her to have treats every once in a while you know yeah yeah that's that's big that's that's cool yeah um yeah well good for you good for you to be able to be aware <laughs> of yourself like that's 
and and to to kind of rewrite the story for your child like it's it's really easy tell me about it it's it's really easy just to to kind of continue a, a cycle yeah. w- without being aware of it it's it's super easy well that is the thing when you're not aware right so i would have continued that cycle because i was continuing the cycle because i wasn't aware yeah. but if then you are aware and you're consciously choosing to continue there there's something else happening there you know what i mean then you're just not willing to face the uncomfortable or you're not willing to to really do the work um and i am willing to and even if we have backtracked a little bit because we're going through a hard time i know in the end i am still better at, at, I don't want, uh, I don't like the word better. I'm different than I was before I was aware. You know, if sometimes I end up being reactive towards her, I, I then speak to her, you know, about it. I speak to her and I tell her like, that wasn't okay for mommy to say, or that wasn't okay for mommy to yell. Like, Mm -hmm. it's not okay that I did that, you know, and trying not to make excuses for my behavior and just Mm -hmm. letting her know that I am having a hard time. Um, and I am not always the most patient, but that's not her fault, you know? So it's like, the more I say that to her, it's not your fault. Um, hopefully I I can't say she's going to understand, but I hope that she will understand that it's not her fault because as children, you and children internalize everything. Um, they think everything is their fault. So if two people are arguing and they're in the other room, they're thinking that's because of them, you know, whether it is or it isn't. Could be, um, yeah. So allowing the children to know, like, this isn't because of you. It's it's not your fault. It takes the, the guilt away from them. And it, it takes the wanting to be different. You know, I felt that as a child wanting to be different because I thought I was the reason my environment was the way that it was. And I don't want her to grow up that way. Yeah, yeah that's that's big. That's that really is. Um, especially treating her as, as an adult in that respect of saying, Hey, it was wrong for me to do that and taking responsibility. They respect you more. They do. Like, hey, look, I was wrong. I'm not perfect. It was wrong for me to do that. You're right. And kid is, this is my parent. Like they're always right. They're always, whoa. Okay. And then, then it helps, helps get past things. And sure. usually if I say sorry to her, like if I'm like, mommy is sorry, I shouldn't have done that. The first thing that she does is say, I love you. Mm-hmm. It's literally like, she says, I love you. And she'll give me a hug most of the time. Mm-hmm. And, and to me, like I said, back, like the unconditional love through that, it's like, it doesn't matter to her that mommy yelled. It's like, it made me sad, but she's still my mom, you know, like <laughs> last night she said, who do you think my favorite person is? And um, I was just joking around, but I said, Harry Potter, cause she loves Harry Potter. And she was like, you and daddy, you know? So it's like one that hurts cause her dad isn't here, but for her to say that and, and mean it, you know, she could have said anybody, she could have said her teacher, who's an amazing, awesome, sweet person who probably never gets frustrated with her, but like, it's still her parents, so. That's good. That's, that's really good. Well, it's, you're, you're doing a fantastic job with her. It it sounds, and yeah, keep, keep, uh, keep your head up. It's, that's a rough time. So I'm going to just send you the best vibes that I can and yeah, tell you that, that everything's going to be all right. It will be, even if it doesn't feel like it, it's trusting yeah it's 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 that trusting you know it's and that's that's one of those lines that that i came across and for some reason it sounds better when either it's told to me versus me telling myself so i gotta tell myself more and remind myself (laughs) don't worry everything's gonna be okay um but yeah it's bob marley (laughs) what bob marley yeah every little thing is gonna be all right you're so right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah, but that's that's big. So yeah, everything's gonna be okay. I gotta remind myself of that when I'm going through like some some shit. So yeah. 
So it's real, but that's life, right? And as we said earlier, there wouldn't be joy without sadness. There wouldn't be light without darkness. It's yeah. balance. It's all part of that. And it's the experience of a human. Um, so as much as it hurts, it's noticing I'm blessed to be able to feel this. I'm blessed to have experienced what I have. Um, and again, that doesn't feel right coming out of my fucking mouth right now, but <laughs> like, I know it to be true. So. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's, it's like being thankful for the lows because without the lows, the highs wouldn't be a thing. Mm -hmm. so, yeah. Yeah. So, awesome. Well, I'm, I'm really thankful that, that you got to, to come on today and we got to, to share your story a little bit and some, some really nice words of wisdom. So I'm grateful. This yeah. probably has set my day off to be a wonderful day. Good. So Good. Yeah, that's a I'm good glad, and, and I'm sure there's there's going to be a handful of people that listen to this that that get some good good vibes and and good information out of it. So I appreciate okay. you coming on. It's it definitely it's more like it's it's a, a big pay it forward kind of kind of a idea behind it because yeah, it's, there's there's so many conversations, so many words of wisdom that that can be shared with others. They're either going through tough times or going through good times. It just need to. Like work on how they they look at the world so whatever it is it's it's nice to be able to share and knowing that the people will hear it who are meant to even if that's today or tomorrow or a year from now or 10 years from now it's like it comes in its time you know it's yeah yeah it comes right on time yeah great all right well it's been a pleasure Brittany. thank you so much for coming on thank you all right. You have a wonderful day. See ya. All right. I'll see you. Hi, everyone. I hope you enjoyed today's podcast with Brittany Dunn. If you are as much of a fan of it as I am, please give it a like, leave a comment, say what your favorite part was, and subscribe if you're really a big fan. And if you're listening to this on Spotify or Apple Podcasts, give it a follow and share it with a friend. Let them know. And until next time. Peace.